Final bosses in Smash Bros games are just plain weird, and it's fantastic. While the series had experimented with these last foes in the various classic mode challenges the first two editions, 64 and Melee, the concept comes into its own with the inclusion of the Super Smash Bros. Brawl Adventure Mode, Subspace Emissary. This wacky story mission allowed players to experience a different and way more linear side of Smash, and to pair finally with this new design opportunity was a whole slew of bosses. While each of these fights has something to take away, I'd bet good money that the one that most folks walk away from this 2008 mode remembering is Taboo, the game's main antagonist and its final boss. This fight delivered a level of intensity in the game that had not adequately been touched on in prior fights of the series, and stays excellent to this day because of it. So when Smash 4, Wii U, and 3DS didn't size up a comparable amount of adventure mode, but instead fleshed out the concepts of the classic modes we discussed earlier, it was a little jarring. Enter Smash Bros. Ultimate's World of Light trailer, and that whole thing turns around, delivering yet again the iconic story mode treasures fans were wanting. And with this return to form came a bunch of new bosses, all culminating in a brilliant fight with the big bad. So today, let's take a careful look at how Sakurai and his team go about designing these wonderfully weird bosses, and makes them so gosh darn memorable. Hey all you beams of light, I'm Skip the Tutorial, and this is Boss Battle Breakdown, a deep dive into the ins and outs of boss design. And hey, if this is your first time here, then make sure to turn that red subscribe button into gray subscribe dust to get weekly insights into your favorite boss fights. I should note here, the reason I think it's best to compare these two fights in particular is that of the similarities of their modes. Both featuring map selection hubs, cutscenes, and health bars set Ultimate's Gleam and Darken fights, and Brawl's Taboo, apart from Smash 4's Master Core. All are fun fights, don't get me wrong, but for today's comparison, I think it's easier to see the strategy invoked within the first two. So like any good fight, let's get right to the attacks. Taking a look over Taboo's moveset, it's clear to see this boss doesn't adhere to just one thing. Although he starts off the fight fairly reserved within his human form, using more expected attacks like a diving slash and chain whip, as the battle progresses, you'll find yourself facing the boss in all kinds of weird forms. Take, for example, his mass production of clone copies in one of his later phases, which fill the screen jam-packed with explosive danger. Or, if that wasn't strange enough for you, look no further than his dastardly eye laser attack, in which he grows several times over you and dances his optical beams across the map. Something worth mentioning here as well with this boss's attack pattern is the substantial prevalence of one-hit KO attacks. Good golly. The one-hit KOs here can really throw you off a streak in the fight. And while I typically wouldn't advocate for this type of design, it does feed into the different character when you die live system of the game, giving a chance for an alternative approach on each respawn, as well as forcing a change perspective for the rest of the fight. And Taboo isn't the only one Sakurai pumped a whole bunch of weird attacks into, with the recent additions that Gleam and Darken in the game's actual final boss fight also delving well into the side. Here, the boss duo's attacks are much more projectile-based, seeing as they don't have limbs like the former. Despite this, their attack scheme does plenty to keep you continually jumping and dodging around the stage. For example, while one throws out its array of cross bombs, the other could be preparing for a devastating dash attack. This requires the player to juggle between the alternating patterns of the two foes, considering the impacts of one's attacks in tandem with the other's offensive. This is also elevated by the fact that you fight both of these enemies at least once before taking on this group match, since you'll be well aware of their different intricacies and variations in how they move. The way these two boss systems come together in this final face-off really might seem confusing and hectic when you first jump in, but the familiarity and the weirdness keeps it as a solid fight. Both of these examples fit within the context of the matches as well, since your face-off with Taboo is a proper convention-breaking finishing match, just as his name would suggest, whereas your time with Galeem and Darken is much more centered around using your previous experience with the bosses to end their earth-shattering combat. To switch over to their defensive here, I think just as much as their unusual moves go into emphasizing the different memorable contexts and designs of the bosses, the vulnerability opportunities also play into this. In your Brawl of Taboo, your critical chance to weaken him down is during the periods where he's teleporting. Sure, you can land some pot shots on him when he's making his attacks, and the eye laser segment mentioned earlier is great for that, but your ideal moment lies in those crucial seconds between his attacks. This further pushes the battle to feel much more opportunistic than your previous experiences as you watch and hunt down every second of downtime to land the final blow. This fits with the idea that to win against Taboo, you can't hold back, but instead use any fleeting moment of weakness to end the fight. This plays in stark contrast to what you'll experience in Ultimate's final boss battle. Here, attack windows are much more readily available, as the bosses hover for more extended periods and forgiving telegraph times. Probably the most apparent example of this trend lies in the segments where the core of either Gleam or Darken will fall to the floor, allowing you to wail on it for a hearty amount of time. Plus, this window of opportunity only closes when the other boss takes a stab at the other core after you. Which is to mention that these bosses will hurt the other. Every bit of design in this fight is to let you know that you are the third wheel in this battle. 
and gives you moments of rest through the boss's primary focus on the other. And as you'd come to expect with any final boss, so much of their design is echoed and concluded within the final few moments of the battle. As you land that one final shot in the blue subspace leader, he slowly convulses in the air. That all important stage clear scene shows up and you're made the victor. As the final cutscene wraps up, the whole world is shown to return back to normal with nary a scratch. The evil impacts of the subspace army are absorbed and ultimately sucked away without a trace. I mean, even Taboo's final explosion is just left to be assumed, as the camera cuts away before he entirely dissipates. World of Light, interestingly enough, despite having fewer cutscenes than subspace, instead ends on a clear depiction of the ending's impact. You see the two beasts crash from the sky, how the spirits are released and then eventually twirl up into the air as you triumph over both sides. The consequences of the battle are made much more apparent here, and I believe that plays into how the bosses are represented as a whole. The lack of explicit detail in Taboo's conclusion pairs great with how strange and unfamiliar his character is, really only being introduced much later into the game's narrative. Whereas the ongoing war between light and dark and world of light reverberates through every aspect of the gameplay, and finally seeing yourself defeat both powers at once delivers the final action to save your world. As I mentioned with the stage clear screen showing up before the finale in Brawl, in Ultimate, it comes after the cutscene plays through its entirety and even into the credits. There is no interruption here, which I believe is to say that the player isn't really done with the fight until they see exactly what happens. In the end, both outcomes undoubtedly feel strange with a lack of dialogue or showcase of the heroes, but I do think that the way they decide to conclude each of these bosses' individual stories feeds into what makes those closing moments of the story modes here's something that sticks with you. Masahiro Sakurai's boss design isn't afraid to venture into the weird. Fittingly, his final bosses are no different. Through examinations of their attack, vulnerability, and ending designs, each one of these modes can properly evoke the different contexts of their respective boss. Even if the plot lines of turning characters into trophies versus turning them into spirits is pretty similar. Bosses aren't exactly known for being the most memorable parts of your average fighting game, but the approach here really can give a proper send-off to how the player's relationship played out with the different bosses. The more in-your-face and prevalent rivalry of Galeem and Darkin makes their almost choreographed dance of destruction feel much more familiar. Yet the foreign location, absurdist attack patterns, and lack of characterization to Taboo cement him as this strange figure, representing more of an idea than a tangible existence. So while these fights do stand as the minority in the Smash Bros. catalog, I'm glad to see this philosophy return. And with the possibility of another installment, I know I'll be hoping for just the weirdest stuff on my TV screen. It's gonna be great. Hey there! If you want to see what makes a good Smash Bros. boss, then plan an up tilt on this one in the top right, or lend some eye lasers down in the bottom right for another video. If you want to support the channel and get new boss battles analyzed every week, then score a fat combo on that subscribe button. But until then, take care, and you have a good one, alright?